Mini episode 1159 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at Sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode number 1159. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris here, and we have an excellent segment coming up today. It is our annual NBA preview show. For that, we have our expert NBA analyst here in the FDH Lounge, fellow FDH Lounge signatory Ben Chu, good friend of mine, the gentleman uh, who is always the first one we turn to for all things pro hoops. We are breaking down the 2019 2020 NBA season with him here today. Ben, welcome back to the show, my friend. Looking forward to breaking this down with you. Uh, it's going to be interesting. As you know, you've got to keep me away. From yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, Pro Hoops is your passion and is something that you have covered uh, extensively for a long time, uh, running your own website, covering it. And uh, again, few, if any, out there that I know personally are more equipped to do something like this than you. You're always the guy I turn to for any kind of uh, insight as to what's going on in the association. So we'll take a look at this here. I'm not going to get bogged down in divisions because, to be honest with you, the NBA doesn't give a crap about divisions. It's basically seeding by conference. On the macro level, looking at the offseason before we get started, we have a little bit of uh, an issue here in terms of the defending champion, Toronto. They are basically the defending champion that nobody is treating like the defending champion because much like how the Cavs in the last year were Eastern Conference champions in name only, defending champions during the season, so too is Toronto. Toronto because just like uh, LeBron decamped for LA a year ago, so too has uh, the centerpiece, obviously, of all things Toronto Raptors uh, decamped for the West Coast, this time the LA Clippers. So you look at uh, what is likely to come out of that and uh, the way that uh, the absence of the centerpiece of the Raptors championship team is going to uh, affect them coming into the year here and uh, what that will do for the Clippers, who, again, Many people, myself included, are claiming as favorites in the NBA this season. Well, for me personally, I take an opposite stand in terms of the Clippers being just general favorites, but we'll get to them in a minute. I think Toronto is going to see a little bit of a fallback. I mean, whenever you see a little bit of like Kawhi Leonard, you're going to take a step back. But considering the Eastern Conference the way it is and how deep that Toronto roster is, they didn't. And one thing that we don't really talk about enough is OG. You know, people's pretty much out for most of the finals, right? Well, that's Shades of being a Kawhi type player. They are, they're going to be going through one of these weird years. That they're either going to be highly competitive or they're going to start the fresh rebuilds coming up. I know Kyle Lowry just re-signed, it, re-signed an extension for $31 million recently, but they're an interesting team. I wouldn't call them head right now in the water, but I would say that there are better favorites, obviously, the top two is being Milwaukee and Philadelphia. It, it seems like I would say Toronto still has a chance if they can put a run together and deal be either and acquire another superstar piece for something at the end of the day, but it's very bizarre to see a champion kind of fall this sort of narrative after being so dominant in the finals the previous season. The question I ultimately have, too, if we really think about it is how good is the Eastern Conference this year, and how do we see any big team going to take the big step forward this year? Yeah, that's what we're going to be looking at, and again, I can't say this enough, I can't put you over enough times, uh, you had the guts to do what I didn't during our finals preview uh, this past season, and that was pick the Raptors, the analytics were pointing in that direction, but that wasn't enough for me, you did that, and uh, much like how I put you over in a discussion on the show with Cynthia Freeland when we were talking about sports analytics, so too shall I mention it again, and uh, again, Toronto, I agree with you, not dead in the water, they are not where the Cavs were a year ago, they still have Pascal 
Siakam. Yeah. They're in a growth yeah. spurt. You still have Lowry. You still have Gasol. You still have all the other pieces in there. You still I mean, have a box. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and that's where again you're looking at a team that uh, again there's there's no way unless they suffer massive injuries that they're not at least a playoff team. Yeah, I mean at this point too, it, I would you know, I'd be shocked if they were not in the top four at the end of the season in the Easter Cup. They very well could be because, uh, again, it is the East, and who else is there <laughs> that's out there? You look at Brooklyn, they, again, are going to be uh, on the redshirt year of Kevin Durant as he is going to be out with his injury the entire way. Kyrie comes in, a little bit of a fresh face there at point guard, but they got a career year a year ago out of uh, D'Angelo Russell. So Brooklyn is a team that a year from now could be poised to join the upper tier of Philadelphia and Milwaukee, but for right now, I don't see it. No, I, I mean, the one thing that you can do with give up Brooklyn right now is their depth is fantastic right now. And especially with the coaching of Kenny Atkins. And you can tell they've played very in preseason, but there's still a lot of uh, pieces that are still going to have to sit around. They're going to have to, their major issue, and I think it's going to be this before Kevin Durant comes back, is who is ultimately going to be their, their power forward of the future. Right now, they're using a little bit for you Prince at that point. And then they have current, they also have... Uh, you know, they can also maybe play a bigger lineup with Jared Allen at the four and DeAndre at the five. But they, this feels almost like this is the year where it's like the rebuild to what they're going to become in the future. But their their talent pool of guys is very good right now. And, they, and their, their general manager, Sean Marks, deserves a lot of credit. But that team was left for dead three years ago. And now they're, they're possibly going to argue be the most talented roster in the Eastern Conference next season. They're an excellent team, and yes, uh, barring a spate of injuries, they project as a playoff team as well. A team that many people think is going to take a little bit of a step backward, myself included, although, again, they didn't make it very far in the playoffs. Boston, they lose Kyrie Irving, they bring in Kemba Walker, who's going to fit in better, but they've already lost Al Horford, so for Boston, it's a year to kind of regroup and see where they can go for the future. Tatum and Brown are going to be leaned upon very heavily this year, clearly. Right, and at this point, too, it's a contract year. And it would not shock me if he leaves the season too. The big question I think for Boston is not whether Kemba can make the offense better. It's going to be become the entire issue that Kemba's had in his NBA career, which is great player but not good enough when it comes to the bigger moments that his team needs him. And there, there's no doubt that Kemba Walker is a premier point guard in the NBA. But my major concern with him moving forward is that he does depend a lot on isolation basketball from from his playing style and. The questions about durability, he did play a lot of minutes in Charlotte, is going to be a question. The one thing I will say about Boston is that they're going to be a lot faster, a lot younger, and I'm intrigued to see year three from Jason Tatum because ultimately that's going to be their future guy moving forward. And the question will be, are we going to see the rookie of the, the rookie Jason Tatum that pretty much almost carried that Boston team to the NBA Finals, or are we going to see the solid but not star potential Jason Tatum that we saw last year? Well, my money would be on improvement from the young players because at least they'll be on the same page. They were not with Kyrie and with his right. selfishness a year ago. So you look at that and as we can... And another thing I'd like to know, too, with mm-hmm. them is that they're going to be a lot more athletic because as much as I love Al Horford as a player, they were very, he, he's a very slow and prodding type center. Right. And they're going to get a lot younger and a lot faster. And they'll, we'll see what Taco Fall and some of their other younger guys have in them moving forward, and it's just going to, I feel like this is one of those traps where they're going to say, well, on paper, they're a really good team, but I, you know, I would not be shocked if they fell to the bottom half or even out of the playoffs if they don't gel together if they're not in the depth of scoring on their roster. Right. I, I would agree with that as well. And uh, again, continuing to look at the other teams that uh, figure to be in the playoffs in the Eastern Conference here, and we'll get to the big two subsequently. Uh, another obvious candidate is Indiana. They're going to get back Oladipo for probably at least the better part of this season back in there. And uh, with, with the offseason moves that they made, uh, they are a very, very compelling team. I don't think they can challenge Milwaukee for the central title for whatever that's worth, but uh, they're a team that, again, keeps saying this again, barring a spate of injuries, Indiana looks like they're going to be there again in April and May. Right, and it, again, we, we've talked, I already mentioned Sean Marks, but very quietly, Kevin Pritchard did a fantastic job in the offseason to yep. get Brogdon from the Milwaukee Bucks to get T.J. Warren from Phoenix for practically nothing. Those are going to be two really important key guys for that team, and like we will talk about probably Utah in the West, Indiana seems like the sleeper team because they have a lot of good young talent. you got two young, great big, Monsabone, and Miles Turner, and you 
have a relatively deep bench there, too. The question is, is that if Oladipo is in back in full form, you, you're looking at a team essentially without a superstar. That's and as right. we know, if we put down the history of the NBA, even the teams that were fringe teams that essentially won a title without a superstar had very elite top talent. And I think at this point, the Patriots have a lot of good talent, but I don't know how elite some of these guys are going to be. Well, and that's it exactly. And Oladipo, uh, at his peak, is, is he among the top six or seven players in the league? And again, even if he is, trying to do it with just one superstar as opposed to at least two, a mega superstar, I should say, it's hard to do. Toronto did it with Leonard last year, so it can be done. But again, Oladipo has to prove he can get to the level of Leonard. So there's still questions to be answered. But uh, again, it's a pretty good uh, near-term future for the Pacers, no question about it. Uh, you look at, again, like we said, not that divisions matter much, but the Southeast. Somebody's going to win the division title and therefore make the playoffs. And to me, that's a division as execrable as it is that could yield two playoff teams, and I think will. I've got Orlando at about 44 wins winning the division. I've got Atlanta at like 41 sneaking in there. They're uh, certainly a big team of the future, but uh, I think the future could start this year as far as at least making the playoffs. And again, that's got to be the goal in the ATL is you this, use this as kind of a springboard type season. So thoughts on those two teams there battling for the Southeast title? Sure. I mean, overall, I really do like Orlando. They have a really good young roster of bigs, obviously led by Aaron Gordon. I think Bamba's going to be a force. Got to give credit to Steve Clipper last season for getting them even in the playoffs of a roster that a lot of people laughed at in the offseason. The real question I have for them is defensively, they're going to be great, but offensively, it's going to do the bulk of the scoring. You would assume it would be Aaron Gordon, but he's shown in periods of time to not exactly have a successful mid range affairs of inconsistency, so they're going to deal with that. Big question mark for them, I think mostly the intriguing question mark at this time is going to be Markel Fultz, the former 76 er draft pick, who has worked relatively decent in the preseason. And if he can sort of solidify himself, you have DJ Augustine and Michael Carter-Williams backing him up. Orlando's an interesting team that could make a deep playoff run if they get everything together. With Atlanta, I love Atlanta, just overall with the stuff that uh, Travis Kalani just did at the Tech season. Not to have did, to have done, just trying to create Warrior East. My only real question with them is that Trey Young's incredible. John Collins is going to be good. DeAndre Hunter will, has shown some early flashes along with Cam Reddish to be good athletic, athletic guys. The real question I have for them is, is that they're starting the, the upswing of their talent. And the question is, is during the Golden State timeline of Curry and Thompson, their initial pump usually started in year two to year three. The only question I have for Atlanta is that I think defensively they're not that good. And while they will be able to keep themselves in games, my range of them, if they get to the playoffs, I don't think in the Eastern Conference you can just outgun teams. And I think the real question for them moving forward is, is that when is it, when is it the point where you have so much good young athletic talent to become problematic in terms of what you're overall reaching, trying to create in terms of people who can Golden State did a great job in their long term in their timeline, but they had those two legitimate scores right off the bat. Well, yeah, I, and you have to have clarity because you and I have talked about this repeatedly on the show previously. One of the things that held back Sacramento for so long, they had teams that I, I thought for a long time were at least in the middle of the bell curve in the league talent-wise as far as young talent, but no clarity on the roster. A whole bunch of ball-dependent guys at one point in time. You draft a guy at the same position you drafted a guy the previous year, blah, blah, blah. Atlanta has a lot more clarity. They're not in, in that kind of a situation, but that's still a concern you have to have with a young team is to find responsibilities and that's something that's got to work itself out as they go. Right, and I, I think the big thing for them is Lloyd Pierce. I think it's going to have the opportunity to win the Coach of the Year award, especially if they get into the top four of the playoffs out of the Eastern Conference. The question I have for them is how you're able to mix the match because they do have a very veteran leaded uh, bench right now. You have Vince Carter, you have Evan Turner, and then you also have Alex Lynn. So they're, they're a team, I think they're trying to figure out what, how they're, how the pieces are going to fit. But especially in the Eastern Conference, where I think pretty much outside the top five, they literal crap shoot. Yeah. Any, any team can make the playoffs at this rate. I don't, even the teams where we perceive them as the worst could probably make the playoffs if they get a couple breaks or if they overachieve. 
I would agree with that. Uh, now, with with the uh, by by the way, as far as it goes with Orlando, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. A young guy that you and I have both been high on previously, as we were Buddy Heald, who broke through last year. Toward the end of the year, Jonathan Isaac started to break through for Orlando. If he becomes what they thought he was going to become, like Markel Fultz from the same draft, that would be a turbo boost to them. Yeah, and I think it would also remiss for us not to mention they do have and also on the roster people of this bitch. Yes. And I think the question is, and the, the discussion under Steve Clifford's long-term career, is he put together great defensive schemes, but offensively, he has not had a really strong team. This is arguably the best team I would say Yeah, They also have a great six-man off the bench and former Raptor Terrence Ross. So they have the pieces. The pieces are there. The question is, offensively, do they have that go-to guy yet? They hope it's Gordon. It might have to be Isaac. It might have to even be Markel Fultz. I don't know what this theory is. Right, and that, they're, they're going to be among the more interesting teams in the league because of that. All right, so with the caveat of putting aside the Cleveland Cavaliers, who I think we'll talk about at the end of this because they're not a team that's necessarily particularly relevant for 2019-2020, but there, there's some things happening that both you and I are picking up on that nobody else in the national media seems to be picking up on. We'll get to them when we're done with pretty much everybody else for this year's preview. So let's put them aside. Aside from Milwaukee and Philly, who we'll get to, Basically, the rest of the Eastern Conference, anybody that you consider noteworthy to talk about that we haven't gotten to yet, that would include the Knicks, the Pistons, the Bulls with their very interesting young lineup, Miami, Washington, Charlotte. Washington and Charlotte look like they're going to be like historically bad to me. Miami looks like at least a bubble playoff team. Chicago, maybe again, like Atlanta, if they gel ahead of schedule, even though I don't see it. Detroit probably looks like they're going to be on the bubble again, I would say. The, the Knicks might be mildly improved based on their decent but certainly not overwhelming off season. So what are you seeing from quote unquote the other teams in the East? Well like I said it's a it's a it's a, it's a grab bag of teams right now. But I do like Miami, Jim Butler will definitely have a chance to shine, but the real question is that they're gonna need their younger guys, Justice Winslow, Bam out of Io, to step up and make big plays for them because if not, if you look at their roster it's still very clunky and they're I'm not 100% sure Jimmy Butler by himself is enough no. to win to get playoffs in the Eastern Conference. If we're looking just on the totality of teams that might find interesting, the Wizards are very, it's strange for me to say this, I think they're going to be better than most people think. They Ooh. have a very, I would say, randomly intriguing roster with Beal, with Thomas Bryant, their, their draft pick, Rui Hashimura. They're, they're interesting. I think if something, some breaks go their way, they could possibly be a bubble playoff team. They did. I'm shocked I'm going to say this, too. I think the Knicks could be a global playoff team to a if R.J. Barrett shows potential that he showed at Duke at periods of time when Zion wasn't on the court. They have a chance to be a great, just a good team moving forward. They just have to figure out their hierarchy. Yes. There, they have the young talent. It's there. There's a pathway, Rick. I can see a pathway for the Knicks at this time. Well, that's a real clip and save about Washington and New York, certainly. I mean, we'll have to uh, file that away and uh, see where that stands at the end of the season. Your, your crystal ball stuff has been pretty good uh, to this point, so I, I'm very intrigued because I hadn't thought of either of those two teams in that context. So we'll see how long they're able to hang on on the margins of the Eastern Conference playoff race. You've got, uh, as we've been alluding to, Philly in the Atlantic and then in the Central, Milwaukee. A lot of people think, myself included, that the East is going to come down to these two teams. A lot of people thought we might get a matchup of them in last year's playoffs. We did not because of the uh, quadruple doink that uh, Toronto was able to put on Philadelphia in the playoffs and then ultimately to take out uh, Milwaukee. So again, the Kawhi Leonard-led Raptors, who don't exist anymore, were able to defeat both of these teams. Uh, But just as LeBron was able to, uh, he abdicated the East crown to Toronto, essentially, Kawhi has abdicated the East crown probably to one of these two teams. How do you see them shaping up this year? I think it's going to be like very similar to the last very recent St. Martin Eastern Conference to determine who's going to move on. The real question I think for Milwaukee, we know their story right now, Giannis, pretty much an unstoppable force right now. Right. Once we get to playoff time, the question is if his jump shot is not falling, is the remaining of that unit are going to have to figure out what to do now. They got a very deep team, a lot of great shooters. They have, you know, they brought on brought in Kyle Corporate. They need have both the Lopez twins now that spread the floor a little bit. You're you're gonna have enough have more, a more solid probably campaign with Dante DiVincenzo, their rookie from last year. It's going to be in my personal opinion with the Bucks, if if I'm being honest, Rick it's going to come down to how much they're going to miss Malcolm Brogdon and how much guys like Chris Middleton and Eric Bledsoe can work for them. 
Right. That's been essentially the story. Because what we saw last season was Giannis can be stopped if you're forced to play him with two guys and force the other team to beat you and the rest, the rest of the Bucks to beat you. Right. Well, that's an interesting point. And again, Milwaukee, the narrative is when you look at the offseason with losing Brogdon that it's sort of a net minus and that Philly had kind of a net plus in the offseason because, yes, you you do lose Butler, but you get Richardson back, which I think has a chance to be close to a wash. They pick up Horford. The, the, but, again, I, just, I continue to have more questions about them because, uh, yes, uh, although the world almost stopped in its tracks when Ben Simmons hit a three in the in in the uh, preseason this year. Uh, again, there's still a lot to be proven by him as far as being an offensive force and at the very least not a liability. I have less questions about Milwaukee. I lean towards them to win the East. Uh, how do you see it between the two of them? You see, ironically, I think we're just in opposite viewpoints. I think Philly is just has a deeper roster at this point of guys that know that they can fit overall. The question for them is, is that what is their, is their how is their, what is their best point? Right. Is it a bigger lineup with Horford and it's Bean and Tobias Harris? Is it better for them to go a little bit more in terms of scoring? Because the question ultimately of what failed them in during the Raptors series was and the health concerns near the end of those games because he's still, to be honest, and he even mentioned this himself after, he wasn't 100% during that year. Right. And my major concern with them is that they are still a very hodgepodge group of who's going to be that guy to help them win because losing J.J. Reddick to New Orleans is definitely going to play a huge role for them. I, I, Tobias Harris is going to have to take on a bigger role. Morford's going to take, have to take on a bigger role. They have a lot of young, springy guys like Bayard Smith that they're one of their draft picks to take to be a title. It's there. I just think overall, though, I think the one concern I still, I, that I have more for Milwaukee than I do have for Philly is this fact. And I think for the fact is the real question is, is it more likely that Philly's big roster doesn't work out, or is it more likely that Philly's big roster can party see on? And I'm thinking the latter more than the former. Okay, okay, very, very uh, interesting. Uh... Moving to the Western Conference here, uh, I'd like to start with the grab bag and just kind of get the teams out of the way here. Uh, in, in the Northwest, you've got uh, Minnesota, who is a perennial bubble team. They look to be again. Uh, they don't always, they don't often, I would say, convert on that bubble. OKC definitely taking a step backwards uh, with the offseason moves that they made, but loading up for that proverbial future. In the Pacific Division, the only team that, to me, doesn't project as a playoff team, I think most people would agree, is Phoenix, not least of which because they still have that glaring hole at point guard. And, again, roster cohesiveness, uh, a question there as well. And, uh, again, in the Southwest Division, you, you've got a number of teams there. Uh, San Antonio, again, they look like a bubble playoff team. Uh, the, the fact that uh, Popovich is the coach, I think, is the main reason that most people would consider that because their roster doesn't necessarily stack up on paper with a lot of even the other bubble teams in the West. Uh, Dallas looking to take steps forward here with their great new youthful core, uh, but year one is going to be a tough sell. Uh, new Orleans, again, year one in their uh, rebuild with their excellent young core, including Zion Williamson. Uh, Memphis, they look like they're going to be the dregs of the league, but like OKC, planning for the future. So thoughts on the teams that are uh, around the margins or worse than that in the West this year? Sure, I mean, and Especially just to bring up OKC and Memphis very quickly. Yeah. They both have great futures. They both have all great young talent. I think Shane Gilder's dog Theater is going to be a coup for the for the Thunder. They, the real question for them is moving forward is some of those older pieces like Steven Adams, are they going to deal, deal him at the trade deadline? Is, is it better to flip and try and get a little bit younger in certain positions for them? They're, it, it, I think, a hodgepodge of what, they, what the team could be. But I will say for OKC fans who had to watch the trade, the West Playmaking ability is incredible, but I'm not 100% sure 
Right, they got a ways to go, and uh, Memphis is one of these markets where, again, it is hard to get uh, big-time players there if, if you don't draft them. So, uh, again, they're going to have their work cut out for them in the years to come. But like you said, they're going to be set up to be able to do that. They're going to have a lot of high picks based on lack of regular season success the next couple of years. So something to keep an eye on. We've talked about uh, everybody from the Southwest thus far, aside from Houston. They are, again, ranking as one of the favorites in the league. Uh, this year and uh, again at the end uh, we should probably talk a little bit about Daryl Morey because there's some off court uh, connotations uh, to their story for this year but uh, again you get Westbrook in there with Harden uh, again there are real questions I think as to what that's going to look like and how you're going to get the most out of both players but clearly the most uh, talented team in that division and one that is capable of just spectacular things offensively again how they how they fit together at this point in time is going to be uh, really interesting to see, but uh, Houston is certainly one of the most compelling stories in the league, and they were even before Daryl Morey got them in uh, the trouble that they're in. Right, and I would note this too, especially just with the Southwest Division to cover some of those teams that like Dallas and New Orleans. At this timeline, I believe both will probably get into the playoffs. I know it's crazy that they can sign on first year that he is going to happen, but he looks like a force in every single preseason game, and David Griffin is done a great job out there putting together a roster that's going to be 12 guys deep and we're going to probably see a lot from there except one their other draft pick to kill Alexander Walker who was fantastic in summer league and fantastic in the preseason for Dallas obviously you got to talk about Porzingis and Doncic together I'm a little bit more lukewarm on them making the playoffs I still think they'll get in just because someone at some point has to get in and they have the most talent of the t- their top two guys of anything else one thing I do have to note with them is that that team will definitely need to have to figure out who their lead guard is going to be on that team. I know Doncic is going to take most of the playmaking duty, but if Jalen Brunson can kind of play a little better, Tim Hardaway Jr. can make more shots. Their bench has a lot of good tool guys that can go in and out. Justin Jackson came from Sacramento, so they have a lot of good guys. And now, move forward just with Houston. I think the real question is, can you have a guy like Westbrook and can you have a guy like Hardy that big of high usage? Because we know they're going to be probably among the top three teams in the Western Conference. The logic dictates no, because Westbrook previously had his usage with another high usage guy, Kevin Durant, in Oklahoma City. So I don't know if that will work. The real question, though, I think, is that the way Houston plays, it's very, I would argue that it, it fits both Harden and Westbrook together as probably best it could. Because if you look at OKC's coaching tree of Scott Brooks and Billy Donovan, they didn't really push eight for those Thunder teams. They were they tended to be more methodical in terms of their scoring. So Houston's deeper. They got a lot of guys that I think a lot of people are going to be surprised by. I I'm here, I think we might see the Ben McElmore reclamation project happen out there with them. And then they got a guy that I, I'm high on right now, Chris Clement, who's going to be a good young who might be the backup guard at some point for Westbrook at the tail end of the season. The question I think for the is that when you have two high usage guys in the playoffs and one is not performing well, we've seen well enough that if, if the usage is too high for both of them, they never win. That's right. That's right. It's, it's got, to, got it's to put together. Yeah. yeah. We've only seen, I think, unless I've been correct, one other time in NBA history where two guys that high usage were able to win the championship, and that was G78 Bullets with Elvin Hayes and Wes Unsell. Yeah, that, uh, again, like you said, there's not a lot of history to back up the notion of them winning a championship, and I think that would be one of the reasons people aren't uh, picking them, by and large, to win the championship this year. People are picking them to be close, but people are not necessarily picking them to be uh, in even in the finals. But, uh, yeah, that is going to be worth watching, and uh, interesting to hear you talk about Macklemore, because he's somebody that I was high on the year that he came out. It'll be interesting to see if he can become a late bloomer in his career. Uh, when you talk about New Orleans and Dallas as potential playoff teams, I got to bring this up. Uh, we'll move to the Pacific here. You must be thinking that at least one of the two teams from No Cal that I have making the playoffs won't make the playoffs. I'm guessing you don't have Sacramento making it in. You probably have Golden State making it in. But uh, who Dallas and Golden State are making the playoffs at the expense of to me is a very interesting notion because I don't have either one of those teams making the playoffs. Golden State, I think, you know, even with what they have at this point. Uh, 
again, barring further injuries, I think is at least a playoff team. I've got them being one and done. Sacramento, kind of the same thing, but from the other end of the spectrum, a young team taking another step forward. So, do you agree that they are both playoff teams this year? Well, uh, I don't think either of uh, I can see there were both of them were playoff teams. Okay. The real question I have is, is that I think Sacramento is just vastly in a terrible state, state because I would argue if you put that roster in East, that's an easy playoff team. Right. But they, despite the Aaron Fox playing line, I love their lineup with Bogdanovich. You know, you see a little bit of Wayne Edmonds this year. They acquired him in the offseason. And we'll see in the year two with Marvin Bagley. My just issue is that I just do not see them beating enough of these teams in the West. To deal with that, and, and they're still very hot. I don't know how they match up. I would say I do tend to agree with you. I think they will get in just because I think Curry at his MVP form is enough. But it would not just surprise me because right now their bench is looking very, very thin. And if you're essentially telling me that Golden State has had issues with Curry when they, he has to be the high usage guy, and we're going to say D'Angelo Russell is going to play well for them, and once they get the big three there, I think they will be a completely different team, and we'll see how they perform, but when your bench, you know, the, the three most notable bench guys you have on the, no, excuse me, the four most notable bench guys you have on the roster is a flame out from Phoenix, a guy that Atlanta traded, uh, and a guy you picked up late in the first round that was kind of a man guy at Michigan, and a guy who was kind of just around. Ben Clyde, it's not good because if, if you're, if Golden State has to rely on Curry scoring 45 a game, he can do it, but usage-wise, it's not going to work out, and my question, too, is that if those big three aren't scoring, who's going to provide the scoring punch? And I don't see a guy that I trust at that point. Oh, that's true. I mean, there it's it's three guys who are uh, ranging from again franchise player and Curry, All Star if he's on his game, like the other two guys, and then basically nine guys from the YMCA or eleven guys or, or twelve depending on roster size. So yeah, no, I agree with you on that. Uh, let's let's put a pin in it uh, for the uh, Clippers and the Lakers here because I want to talk about them sort of head to head in a moment. Go to the Northwest Division and let's put a pin in Denver and Utah because they're the teams that I. Think most of us see battling it out there. Uh, Portland, to me, is another team that is kind of a uh, bubble playoff team. I do have them making it in. It will help them having Nursik back this year uh, as they go for another playoff run. Again, a team that, uh, uh, well, again, you are expert on all teams in the league, but one that's right in your backyard, so you are even more uniquely qualified to talk about them. Thoughts on Portland this year, and if they, in an increasingly tough Western Conference, look like they can still make the playoffs. I, I think, and I, it, it sounds, I would say it's a homer narrative, but I would argue that it, the numbers I saw, it's absolutely ridiculous. They don't get it. Mm-hmm. it, it they, they definitely have a much improved team from last year. They acquired the final last night from the Andy, who's going to be able to spell Nurkic until he's able to get back healthy. You got a lot of good young guys, Anthony Simon, Zach Collins, they're going to be two guys to walk for them if they can make the jump. But they also have a very deep roster of very good players can't be more. Uh, Mario has something with them now, too, and they, I, I just find it bizarre that, very similar to San Antonio, who we kind of doubt every year, they just keep making the playoffs anyway, and uh, as long as Dave and CJ are healthy, this might be the deepest team they have in terms of offensive talent, just generally. Well, yeah, that's going to be worth watching, definitely. Uh, again, it's going to take a lot for them to be able to compete for, again, for whatever this thing is worth, mostly on paper, the divisional title between Denver and Utah, because uh, most uh, people have them as being among the legitimate uh, potential champions of the Western Conference. Again, we're going to get to the two teams in L.A. in a second who you have an awful lot of people looking at as being favorites, but there are a lot of the rest of us that look at Denver and or Utah uh, as, as potentially making it there. Denver Denver with, again, uh, not so much the offseason that they had, although two years in a row now in the draft, they have gotten huge potential steals following up Michael Porter Jr., who I think is going to be good to go this year with Ball Ball in the draft this past year. So uh, just making that roster even deeper. Utah with an excellent postseason here. You, you are hearing a lot of potential Western Conference championship buzz out of both franchises. How do you see them? Uh, I, I'll start with Utah. I really like Utah. They're very deep. I think Mike Conley is a great piece for them yep. to work out. They got Bogdanovich from Indiana. Mm-hmm. The question I do have, and I think it's a fair question to ask, is, is they've had a lot of one and done in the playoff review. Yeah. And this is, I would say, Quinn Snyder's make or break year. And offensively, they have their best roster. But the question I do have to ask is, is Don Penn Mitchell up to the task of being that guy and being able to help Utah win in the prime months? Because we saw he does have the tendency to playoffs. He didn't have the greatest sophomore season in the NBA. And we'll, we'll see. I, I think they're a sleeper team, but I, I've always been more questionable of sleeper teams that kind of have a lot of good guys, but don't have the guy. And 
They have an incredibly deep lineup. Jamal Murray re up with them. You're going to see Michael Porter Jr. play a little bit more. You're going to see him probably be their crunch time scorer, which I, I think is probably what his role should be, honestly, on that team. And you have arguably the most, yeah, I mean, it's weird to say this, but arguably the best passing center we've ever seen. Yeah. Outside of Will Chamberlain, Will Jokic. And you have a guy like Mike Malone, who I think has put together a great system. They have a great general manager out there, whose name I will not butcher, just to make, just to make sure. Okay. I'm not going to butcher his name, but they've done a fantastic job with the international scouting. And they're just really deep, and they're really good. And I think the issue that, I, that a lot of people are seeing with them is that they still don't have that crunch time, prime time score. And I think, weirdly enough, if Michael Porter Jr. shows what he showed in the preseason so far in just terms of getting buckets, he can be that guy for them. That might have to be his only role. They might have to tell him, like, look, we need you to get 10 points in the fourth quarter. We don't care how you get them. We want you to get 10 points in the fourth quarter. And I think that's completely doable for a player of that talent. Yeah, I mean, nobody questioned his talent coming out in the draft. I mean, that's a guy that would have been, even in a loaded draft, the first, second, or third pick, I think, consensus on most boards. He only drops as far as he drops because of the questions that there were physically about him, and he's had more than one question physically, so it's a matter of how he holds up. But yeah, I agree with you that Denver is an absolutely loaded team, and uh, it's just, it's weird because I don't know that there is another team in big four sports in North America that has been around as long as the Nuggets and have had less of a, an enduring footprint than they have. There's almost nothing that you think of when you think Denver Nuggets over the years. You've, you've got to go back basically to like the ABA days uh, of the Nuggets when they were really good, but uh, since they joined the NBA, their moments have been fewer and further in between than almost any other team that's been around this 40 plus years in the NBA. I agree with you, that's about to change. I have them making it to the Western Conference Finals. I have them losing to the Western Conference Champions in my estimation. I'm on the Clippers bandwagon. Uh, again, you, you have uh, two mega franchise players now uh, at the top there. You, you have some other questions and you've raised them with me off air about depth and especially depth of scoring. I think they've got enough because they did have to let go of Shea uh, Gilgis Alexander obviously to get Paul George, but they were able to keep most of the rest of what was a very enviable young core last year as we saw out there. So I'm on board with them. Those that aren't on board with them tend by and large to be on board with the Lakers winning it here. The notion of uh, LeBron and Anthony Davis, uh, that's a thing where, again, you look at uh, Danny Green to come in and give the clutch scoring that he could possibly give, as he has done for two NBA champions now, including last year's Raptors. But uh, uh, I, I look at that, Kyle Kuzma is going to miss the first part of the season, it looks like. So this, this Lakers team that had so many uh, young guys with quote-unquote upside a year ago, many of them were liquidated in the offseason in pursuit of the other moves. To, to me, the Clippers actually look slightly deeper of the two teams. And that's why I kind of lean towards them. But uh, as far as that goes, and as far as you've already indicated, you think Denver might be your choice for the West. In terms of if either of these two teams would be playing them, who would you see it being? At this rate, I would say the Clippers is probably the most likely. Because just like you said, in terms of their depth. And I mean, my real question is, is that when it's Kawhi, Lou Williams, and Paul George, who's going to be the guy that they go to in the crunch, the crunch time moment? going to be their big thing. My only question, and I said this, is that outside of those three guys in Montrezl Harrell, they really don't have another consistent score on their roster. It could be Jerome Robinson, their draft pick of a couple seasons ago, who's shown flashes of being a good player in, uh, in the preseason. The Lakers, I think, are, it's weird for me, and this is a weird argument I like to make for Lakers. I think the Lakers have a better starting lineup than the Clippers do, but I think the issue that the Lakers have to deal with is that they're remaining keys are not as, as the Clippers at this period of time. But I, I have a feeling uh, with LeBron and Anthony Davis that they'll, they're going to figure something out overall just in terms of offense because I, I don't know how you stop the team with both those guys on there. I would agree with that. And then when, you, when you're looking at it, for, for as much as everybody put over the mix in Miami with uh, LeBron and D. Wade, and ultimately as, as great as the combo with LeBron and Kawhi was, I'm sorry, LeBron and Kyrie, I should say, in Cleveland, slip of the tongue. Uh, I, I think LeBron and D. Wade, that's pretty much the combo that most people think of in the, in the course of his career. I mean, I, I would say on day one, with all due respect to prime D. Wade, I would take LeBron and A.D. over them. Would you agree? I would tend to agree with that, too. I mean, 
mean, and one thing I'll give a note too is that I'm still very skeptical of teams that come together after only one season of major moves, include it, with both the Clippers and the Lakers. It just seems that I've gone through this in the history of the NBA outside of Kawhi Leonard. There hasn't been many instances in the history of the NBA where a team has made wholesale changes in the offseason. They won the title that same season. I and agree. I, I, that's why I'm kind of a little bit lower because it feels like, in my opinion, it's very foolhardy to say that the Clippers and the Lakers are favorites at this point, considering both have majorly overhauled their rosters at this time. Well, uh, something I want to ask you about as well when you're talking about the historical aspect of this, because uh, it was about, uh, I, w- I, w- I would say, a year and a half ago on the show, whenever it was that we did our, maybe a little bit longer, our uh, top ten of all time in the NBA list, going through and ranking players. And uh, again, at that point in time, the, Kawhi Leonard wasn't even getting honorable mention votes, because that's a th- it's understandable, because... He's the rare case of somebody who looks like an all-time great player who was something of a late bloomer, didn't have the college pedigree, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but somebody who, in the end, even if he didn't have the billing coming into that series, was the best player on the Spurs when they won the championship in 2014, hence his finals MVP, doing it again in Toronto. I mean, if he can get one year one with the Clippers, I mean, he's got to start getting some top ten all-time talk, does he not? A a guy who can move around to that degree? I think think that's pretty much automatic. Okay, yeah. I'm just more skeptical, and I've said this, we've seen it, and it was the same thing when the big three came in, it's the same thing with the big three came together in Cleveland with Kyrie, Caleb, and LeBron, and even Miami when the big three came together there. It usually takes a team a season to get acclimated with each other to win the title that year. Like I said, Kawhi last year is probably the biggest outlier, but if you look at that Grizzlies team, I mean, not that Grizzlies team, but that Raptors team, most of the pieces were already there. Right. And both in the Clippers and the Lakers there, there's a lot of young new guys doing new things for this team. And the question I have to have is when playoff time comes around, will those guys be depended on and considered or in considering of a team like Denver or Portland who's already got to that mark of big, uh, not, excuse me, of teams like Portland or teams like Denver or teams like uh, Houston, who, who have had some changes, but most of their roster is pretty much stayed intact. How are, how are they going to be able to perform in that way? That's a very good question, and uh, in terms of looking at the big picture here uh, in the league uh, for the, the final four, as it were, I've got Milwaukee over Philly in six in the east, Clippers over Denver in six in the west, Clippers over Milwaukee in six in the NBA finals. How much differently, if at all, would you see it? Uh, well, we, I know this too, and I think it can be kind of figured out, but Philly over Milwaukee in the east, and then in the west I have Denver over the Clippers, it's going to be, I think it's going to be Denver Philly in the finals, and Philly finally, the profit finally worked out for them, and I have them winning, because we all know too, Rick, if Denver wins the NBA finals, the world might riot, so. Right. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that could that could be end times, but uh, well, I'm sure uh, all the uh, the Philly fans out there uh, would love to see that kind of a scenario. And again, I think they have a chance to make uh, a very deep run. Two things that, like I said, we wanted to put a bookmark in until we were done talking about uh, this season on the court. I'm going I'm to continue on the court here for the moment. We, uh, we we put a bookmark in it to talk about the Cavs subsequently. You and I have talked about this an awful lot, and again, I'm sure there's going to be people saying, oh, Rick Morris, Cavs homer. And, and, and again, I admit that I'm excited as a lifelong Cavs fan at the long-term prospects here, maybe even medium term, but I am equally befuddled that nobody else is seeing this because, again, you look at it, and I don't think you can really dispute these facts. Fact, Colin Sexton was a top-tier guy in that loaded draft of 2018. He was pretty much just about the end of the tier there. Michael Porter, the last uh, guy who who went subsequently, but he had the big injury questions. Uh, Again, Colin Sexton last year, yeah, the analytics weren't very flat. But uh, he was on a young team where nobody was playing defense. He looked a lot better with Kevin Love late in the season. And by the way, he was a much more natural scorer during the season than people thought he would be. So Colin Sexton, you start with him. You add to the mix uh, Darius Garland, who, uh, with all due respect to John Morant, I think we'd be talking about uh, Garland in the same breath in this year's draft. And somebody like Kevin Porter Jr., again, uh, the questions for him, unlike Michael Porter, uh, who had the physical questions, for Kevin Porter, it was a perceived maturity issue 
issues like that. He got suspended at USC last year. There was a big three in the draft this past year. And again, I was despondent that the Cavs initially weren't going to be picking in the top three because I wanted one of those three guys, as did everyone. But the more I look at it, the more I see what they were able to do. And yes, oh, by the way, uh, getting uh, Dylan Wendler, who looks to be an excellent uh, piece off the bench for a long time to come, a little bit of spare shooting and maybe some rebounding off the bench for a long time to come. But you look at these two guys, and again, I kind of look at it like that big three might have been a big five if there weren't questions about these two. If Garland had been able to play a full year, but again, Kyrie Irving was the last big point guard to come out who had these kind of issues like, oh, he only played a handful of games during the season. Worked out pretty good for him, coincidentally also going to the Cavs. Kevin Porter Jr., nobody questions this guy's physical abilities. Uh, in a lot of ways, he gets compared to, and, and I think he's consciously modeled himself after James Harden in a lot of ways. So I look at this, I, I look at a, a Chetty Osman, who is a good kind of jack-of-all-trades, who looks like he's going to be on this team for quite some time. The pieces that are there, the pieces that could still possibly be coming when you move, ultimately, a Tristan Thompson, uh, a Delhi potentially, if he gets moved later in the year. He's not going to get you much, but he might get you you know, another spare part coming back. I look at this, and, and like you, I'm befuddled as to why people aren't seeing more than this. Zach Lowe, even putting the Cavs 29th in his league pass ratings, he said, I understand I could look stupid if Kevin Porter Jr. looks like he's going to be part of the rotation. Well, he will, but I mean, to say that they're the 29th most interesting team in the league is a significantly worse take than saying they're only going to win 15 or 20 games. I got them winning 28. I thought I was the high outlier on that one until I talked to you. So I'm relieved as a fan talking to you that you are seeing the same things I'm seeing and potentially then some for the future. Right. Well, well, Rick, as someone who's already grown up in the Portland area, it's very similar to the whole team and CJ experience out here. Right. And I see a lot of the same things that are very prevalent to how it would be that this Portland team go to a Western, their first Western Conference final in 2000. I projected roughly around like 30, I had them at around 34, 35. Wow. Which, again, I, I always tell people with a caveat, and then obviously still has to be on the roster and, right. and, and for, the, for the entire season for them to get to that point. Sure. But they're, they're going to be very, it's going to be very interesting to be line during his career in Michigan. I know he tended to spread the floor a lot. He, he found guys to get to their spot to spread the offense. We're gonna, and we're going to see probably the first time in a long time. With, and this kind of even dates back to the early, late 90s. Phoenix teams will end up playing Seattle in, the first, in their first round in 19. 96, I believe, that had a, a lineup of Jason Kidd, Kevin Johnson, and uh, uh, and for some weird reason, I'm blanking on it now, but um, of just go, having like three very small guards on the floor, able to pass and to just make uh, big plays. And if they can figure it out, Rick, uh, I would be kind of be befuddled, in my opinion, to not see them take a big step forward because we've seen it happen so many times when a team has been discounted by analysts or experts make a pretty, you know, just a relatively sizable big jump. Yeah, I mean, and there's no substitute in this league for talent and especially scoring talent. And all three of these guys can put the ball in the bucket. Garland looks like he's maybe a little bit better of an all-around point guard than Sexton, so it, it may settle into that role a little bit. But uh, Garland, and, and again, Sexton proved to be a very good outside shooter. Garland looks even better in that way. Porter looks like a guy who can really kind of do it all. And you mentioned John Beeline, and that to me is the glue of the whole scenario. As much as I liked a lot of the 30-something young assistant coaches that were interviewing with the Cavs, you got to get a guy like Beeline line in here for something like this a veteran guy a teacher somebody that they can buy into what he's teaching and this is a thing where again and this is a real clip and save thing for people people can feel free to throw this back in my face subsequently because I have confidence in it but Beeline to me is doing what Steve Kerr did when he came into the league as a head coach trying to change the paradigm he's he's looking at what he has available what it's going to take to try to get the most out of them the Cavs are not a cookie cutter kind of a thing right now in, in terms of the way that they're approaching this, and maybe that's why they are being underestimated, notwithstanding, like I said, the potential explosiveness of at least those three guys with the young scoring. But uh, in in terms of redefining how you're going to try and make it happen, coming in and trying to set up a system that the league is not used to seeing, that's where I think Beeline and what he's trying to do is is basically the secret sauce to this whole thing. Right, and the major thing with those Phoenix teams, and I just want to make sure I bring back to that timeline too, is I forgot it was Rex Chapman. Who was yes. Sir. What they did was a lot of it was a lot of paint bait in like got guys like uh, Kid could penetrate, Kevin Johnson could get to the basket, and Chapman could always hit threes. My thing 
with the Cavs, if you're going to follow sort of that model, you're really going to have to play. You're going to have to lead the league in minutes or close to it because yep. you're going to need to get a lot of shot opportunities. And you're going to have to want to make it. The major question that everyone seems to have like, can you win if your defense is poor? So well, Cleveland's defense was arguably last year one of the worst in NBA history, and our, I mean data point wise, the worst in NBA history. The question is, is that in a, if you're choosing to extend the game and score more points, that's going to give you more opportunity to get baskets and to make and to get wins in comparison to last year where Cleveland didn't really have a great scoring rotation right now. Like, the best two scorers were Sexton and Jordan Clarkson. So, obviously, you would assume guys like Garland and Kevin Porter Jr. are stepped up. And I think the question for Beeline, especially early in the season, is if he decides to go all in early, this is a team that has the potential to make the playoffs if everything sort of goes their way. If he doesn't, you're going to see a team that's probably 24, 27 wins. I would agree. I would definitely agree with that. And, uh, yeah, this is definitely something where uh, we're going out on a little bit of a limb because a lot of people aren't seeing this, even in the Cleveland media. So, uh, it, which, which again, to me, is just completely befuddling. But, uh, again, you, you can't teach talent. And uh, yeah, that's that's a thing where this team has that in well, spades. Well, you can't teach young talent. Young talent, yeah, exactly. Exactly, and uh, they, they, they really do have it all in that way as far as what they are capable of. The other thing we put a bookmark in to talk about here at the end is, because this is off-court, but the whole thing with Daryl Morey and what this is doing potentially to the globalization of the, of the NBA, and this is something that no major sports league has really had to confront previously, which is everyone looks at the, the, uh, the upside of globalization and, oh, new markets, and, uh, yeah, but it's something that tech companies have already had to worry about for years in terms of doing business in, in China is, and, and again, uh, in, in my personal opinion, which is shared uh, by, by a great many, uh, the Chinese government is one that is tyrannical as far as how it deals with its own people. There is now the situation with Hong Kong that is putting that whole thing back on the world stage in no way uh, that we've seen since uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989. You've got to go back that far to when it was pretty much on center stage the way it is now. So Daryl Morey, it's one of these things where, in a cynical sense, a bad business move to do that, to to make that statement of support for the people of Hong Kong. It's a thing where it it, it hurt the bottom line of the Rockets, it hurt the bottom line of the NBA. In in a cynical, cynical, narrow sense, which is how we define so many things in life, the wrong thing to do. I will say the right thing, morally at least. His heart was in the right place. I appreciate that he has appreciation for the people of Hong Kong and what their aspirations are. So, again, this is something that we're seeing the NBA. They are the first league because I think they've been the most aggressive in terms of trying to do global domination uh, from, you know, from a business perspective. This won't be the last time they have to deal with something like this. When you're, when you're after global domination, you are going to be getting in bed with some messy people, and this is the first time ever that that's had to really be confronted in a major way. Right, and, uh, and again, hopefully you're not going to get a friendly super. Uh, just just going to have to, we're going to have to prepare for the work if that does happen. But right. One thing I will know, and, and it's a point that we discussed off air, is that I give Maury a lot of credit for what he was trying to do and was trying to say. The thing that I, I'm still sort of ambivalent about in his case is that he's a very smart individual. He went to MIT. It just seems like a, it was, at the moment, very stupid. Arguably very fucking stupid. But I feel like mo- most people, especially when it comes to freedom of speech, tend to treat freedom of speech in two different categories. It's freedom of speech in real life and freedom of speech on social media. Right. And sadly, in this day and age in social media, I don't think we have freedom because we exist in a world where you can be banned for saying certain things or for doing certain things or posting certain things to the internet. So I think it's always a trickle, tricky scope, a tricky scope, a tricky flow to try and deal with these sort of things. And I'll be honest, it was the, my major narrative with Maury, to be honest, is that he should have known better because he's a smart guy. And on top of that, he already knows the fight. He will have been for example, I use this analogy. He's not Sam Presley of the Oklahoma City Thunder, where you can maybe possibly feign ignorance to say these sort of things. Right. And I think that that's the ridiculous part of the campaign is that we've known this from the time the first person got fired for using social media. Is whatever you say on, on social media is reflective of who you're employed by. 
or what you're an owner of, or et cetera, et cetera. And I think the NBA is going to face some blowback from this. I, I don't think the, that the Chinese government is going to do something as brash as cancel the NBA in China. I think that's way too far gone. But are deals going to be renegotiated? Are certain teams going to take the hit? At some point, I think they will. And we, I mean, we saw them with the two preseason games where there's very little fanfare when it should have probably been a celebration of the NBA just being in, it, being in China and playing these games between two very interesting the Lakers and the net. But I think, again, we always run the tricky gambit of social media. And it's really interesting to see that possibly billions of dollars could be lost because Daryl Morey decided to tweet out support for Hong Kong in just one fell swoop. It, 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 I, I find it absolutely bizarre. And one thing I wanted to know, I did my research myself, the NBA has been playing games in China for a very long time. I think people tend to forget this. The first game ever played in 2018 was the Bullets in 79, I believe it was either Beijing or Shanghai. Wow. So they've been playing, in the NBA teams have been playing in the country for a long time. And at the end of the pursuit of the almighty dollar, it's probably best not to irritate certain things. And while while I support Maury's call for Hong Kong at that level, the thing I don't support is this whole fading of, well, of his message, of his message of how he delivered his message. Yeah. And we all should, I now know, if you are reflective of your employer right. at the end of the day. Right. Even if the opinion, if you with the employer, you're reflective of what you're saying. So, like I said, it, it's some weird way that starts expansion in the NBA, Rick. I'm not going to complain about it, but there, we're going to see some of the financial money get spread out to dip some of these different countries, especially, and maybe even great for the NBA, is they played their first two preseason, their first two games ever in India. So it would not shock me to see them push a little bit more in India moving forward. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, that might be a way to counteract it. And uh, I'll, I'll sum it up from my point of view on this note. I think what this always comes down to, as much as anything else, is making a power move and setting a marker for in the future. The Chinese government right. wanted to make damn sure nobody's ever going to do this again. And again, from a in a business sense, bravo, they succeeded. Uh, in, in a personal moral sense, uh, to me, it's not a great thing because yeah, Adam Silver's got to be on speed dial with every owner saying none of your people can ever say anything like this ever again. So China's going to get what they wanted out of it, which is to send a message and to make sure they never have to deal with this ever again. Right, and ultimately, sadly, I don't think there's really any winners. At no. This period. Nope. There's no winner. Again, I, I, it's very weird to say that. It's, it's very similar. We've now, in the NBA, three of the biggest stories have had to be encompassed by people doing dumb things on Twitter. Now, I find it it's crazy to think about in this day and age that literally a social media platform has buckled governments and financials and ended careers due to burner accounts and shame and all. I, I just, it, it's a bizarre story on top of a bizarre story, but it, I, it again teaches us one of the rules that I've always lived by is like, is to not talk, not make political statements on social media. You, right. It's not a, there's no win for anyone at that point. You're better off focusing on entertainment and stupid videos at that period of time. Yep. I mean, uh, Twitter's the epicenter of everything these days, from cancel culture to uh, presidential rage tweeting on the can at 5 in the morning, all kinds of things. Twitter is where you want to go to find anything and everything that is relevant in the world today, and the NBA is, of course, among these topics. And uh, it is uh, one of the great pleasures on this show to talk all things NBA with you, Ben Chu. Thank you so much for being here today for our preview of the 2019-2020 season, my friend. Hi, I appreciate it as always, Sonic 2024. <laughs> I look forward to that happening and a subsequent Cavs-Sonics uh, finals matchup. You and I will have to attend all of the games together when and if that happens. We'll look forward to that. Uh, we'll, we'll bookmark that for the future, but that's well down the road. For right now... This is mini-episode 1159, our 2019-2020 NBA preview with good friend and a fellow FBA slouch dignitary, Ben Shu. Thank you all for tuning in today to the program. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all Clear Channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IAMBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time 
Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QBC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse, and The Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 